Hello everyone, um, this is topic four, cellular respiration. This is gonna be one of the shorter review videos. If you are watching this right now, I just want to take a moment and commend you for being so um, dedicated to this class and uh, dedicated to your AP exam and just biology in general. So good for you. Um, you have a handout that you can fill out as you do this i tried to copy and paste as much as i could and then with the diagrams if you just want to pause and maybe jot down a few notes on some of those diagrams this shouldn't take too long so with cellular respiration remember we have three stages glycolysis the krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and i just want to touch on each one of those um, stages real quick and then talk a little bit about fermentation and then I have a practice FRQ at the end so you can see an example of what a cellular respiration FRQ would look like. Um, and the FRQs that I'm picking are, um, are, pretty, are, are sort of in line with what they're doing this year, uh, maybe even just a little bit more difficult. All right, so here you have a picture of the mitochondria and you can see um, what we discussed in class was that glycolysis occurs on the outside of the mitochondria because it is considered an ancient process. And remember, all living things do glycolysis, so therefore, um, even though you're not tested on evolution, I still throw this in there just because it's what I've always done. Uh, glycolysis is considered an ancient process. All living things do it, so therefore, it is considered evidence that we evolved from a common ancestor. Um, then you have the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, which occurs inside the mitochondrial matrix. And then you have the electron transport chain, which occurs, remember, it's the proteins that are embedded in this inner membrane, that inner folded membrane, right? And we see that inner folded membrane. Why is it like that? Well, as we saw with the FRQ that we practiced last week, the, um, inner fo the, the folded membrane is going to increase surface area to volume ratio, which increases efficiency. So more electron transport chain per unit of volume is why that is like that. All right, glycolysis. So remember, you have two phases of glycolysis. You have an energy investment and then an energy payoff. And I use the analogy that's like a business. In order to start a business, you have to put money in. But in the end, hopefully, if it's a good business, you're going to make more money and you're going to make a profit. So that's kind of like what glycolysis is. It's the, um, and then I also use the analogy like my kid sitting on top of the slide. I got to give her a little push. And then she, uh, the, it's a spontaneous thing where gravity takes her down. But you got to give that little push in the beginning. So the energy investment is going to be the two ATP. And what that's going to do is phosphorylate this compound so that it's uncomfortable and there's enough tension to where it splits in half. So now you have your two uh, compounds here. Um, NAD comes in and takes a hydrogen and electron. Um, ADP turns into ATP. Then you have water given off as a waste. ADP turns into ATP. And then you finally end up with two pyruvates. So you do not need to know any of these names. Um, honestly, I don't even think you need to memorize what the products are. The, the AP exam is going to be more based on data analysis. I would just have a general idea of what is glycolysis, where does it occur outside the mitochondria, um, and overall what's happening. Well, it's the process that gets cellular respiration started. You have to use a little bit of ATP to get it started. You end up with a little bit of ATP and two pyruvates. So you spend two ATP, you make four. So the net profit is two ATP. Then you have a couple of NADHs and then water is a waste and then two pyruvates, all right? Then pyruvate is going to travel into the mitochondria. Right. As pyruvate travels into the mitochondria, it gets converted into acetyl-CoA. All right. So as it travels in, it gets converted into acetyl-CoA, cool NAD, which is our, our electron shuttle. Remember, it's picking up electrons and hydrogens, taking them over to the electron transport chain, which is our third phase. A little carbon dioxide gets, uh, is given off as a waste. Okay, awesome. Acetyl-CoA, remember, is going to combine with oxaloacetate all right 
And then this is just the summary version. You're not given any names to, to confuse you. It's the summary version. Carbon dioxide's given off as a waste. NAD comes in, picks up hydrogens and electrons. You get a little bit of ATP. Ooh, FAD, which is another electron shuttle, comes in, picks up hydrogens and electrons. So what is the overall purpose, really, of the citric acid cycle? It's just a series of redox reactions where electron shuttles are coming in and stripping hydrogens and electrons away from what was that original glucose molecule. So that's the whole purpose. Take hydrogens, take electrons. And what are hydrogens and electrons going to ultimately be used for? The electron transport chain to make ATP. And so here's your more detailed version here. Acetyl-CoA combines with oxaloacetate to make citrate. Cool, all of these different, wow, amazing. When I was in college, we had to actually have all these memorized. Thank goodness people are more reasonable now and you don't have to do that. Um, but really the overall idea here is NAD and FAD are coming in, taking hydrogens and electrons, right? And so remember, little tiny bit of ATP, just not that much is made. Carbon dioxide's given off as a waste. Remember, this is supposed to be six. Six NADHs, two FADH2s. You don't need to have any of those um, numbers memorized. But if someone said, what happens during the citric acid cycle? You would want to know, okay, that, that's where NAD and FAD are coming in. They're taking hydrogens and electrons off of what was originally that glucose molecule so they can take them to the electron transport chain. Okay. And hopefully I'm not going too fast here. Uh, you may have to pause. Um, I am actually about to go up to the school to, to feed the bees. So I, I do need to kind of to kind of go through, and so I can't really pause. But if you need to pause the video, obviously you can do that. But I would just jot down some notes next to each um, diagram and then add it to your, um, your little packet, which will eventually have 10 topics. So this is topic four out of 10. Um, gosh, we're almost halfway through our review. All right, um, so the electron transport chain, that is called oxidative phosphorylation. It's as opposed to, remember what the other type of phosphorylation was? Not photophosphorylation. Photophosphorylation is what happens during photosynthesis. But in um, cellular respiration, oxidative phosphorylation is a, as opposed to substrate level phosphorylation. So substrate level phosphorylation is where an enzyme gets used. And during glycolysis, and during citric acid cycle, you actually have substrate level phosphorylation, um, which is not super efficient, and that's why not very much ATP gets made. But in the electron transport chain, you have oxidative phosphorylation, and you can see that that is very efficient because of how much ATP actually gets made. So your electron transport chain is gonna make the most ATP, give you the most bang for your buck, I guess, and it uses a process called chemiosmosis to do that, and chemiosmosis is when hydrogens are pumped against their concentration gradient, they find ATP synthase, they diffuse back through ATP synthase, turning the rotor, turning mechanical energy into chemical energy in the form of ATP. So cool. And if you watch my, surely if you're watching this video, you watch the photosynthesis video. Um, and like I said, you are uh, so dedicated to, to continue doing this even when you're not being held accountable. Uh, it will show in your uh, AP score and in your performance in biology next year, um, if you are taking college biology next year. So this is just showing you the electron transport chain. Same thing like photosynthesis, except hydrogens are being pumped out instead of pumped in. It's the exact same concept though, so I wouldn't get caught up in that. So NAD and FAD are dropping off the electrons, dropping off the hydrogens. As the electrons get passed to one electron carrier to another, they are, uh, it is causing the pumping of hydrogens against their concentration gradient. And then the hydrogens are going to find ATP synthase, and it is a process called chemiosmosis when the hydrogens diffuse through ATP synthase, turning the rotor, causing the phosphorylation of ADP. So it's a very, very efficient process. It's going to make the most ATP. And I think the last thing that you need to know about cellular respiration is oxygen is sitting at the very end of it all driving this whole process, at least driving the electron transport chain, because uh, oxygen is basically very electronegative and it is pulling electrons through the electron transport chain. And what's the pulling? Well, the pulling is the protons in the nucleus of the oxygen atom attracting the negative charges of the electrons. 
So in other words, it's very electronegative. And so it's pulling the electrons through and it is going to be the final electron acceptor. So it's going to accept electrons, it's going to accept hydrogens, and it is going to basically leave the whole cycle as water. So it's kind of considered like a waste product. Although we know water is used for so many different things, it's never a waste. But in the process of cellular respiration, water is actually considered a waste because we don't really need water um, to, to perform cellular respiration. We need oxygen, but we don't actually need the water itself to do anything. So after the oxygen accepts electrons, after the oxygen is accepted, the hydrogens, it turns into water, and then water leaves as a waste. What would happen if you did not have oxygen? What would happen if you did not have oxygen is this entire process would be shut down because there would not be anything at the bottom here attracting electrons through. If electrons were not being attracted through, hydrogens would not be pumped against their concentration gradient. Hydrogens would not diffuse. ATP would not get made. If ATP is not made, then there is no energy for your actual organs to work, and so you would go into organ failure, which is really sad to think about. All right. So in the absence of oxygen, there are actual organisms that can survive. So remember, we have um, certain bacteria that live in deep sea thermal vents that can survive, can't survive with oxygen. Not only do they not need oxygen, if there's oxygen around them, they will actually die. So those are obligate anaerobes. I am more interested, though, because we don't really deal with them because like, we're not around them because we need oxygen. So we don't really bother them, they don't really bother us, they're just kind of interesting. The one thing that we are interested in are these facultative anaerobes that do both. And so human muscle cells, for a certain time period, can function without oxygen. They'll go into the process of fermentation, not alcohol fermentation, but lactic acid fermentation. And then as we know, um, as we saw with our root beer, which is still sitting in the refrigerator, you are still going to be welcome to come into my classroom and try your root beer. I have no idea if it's gonna be flat by that point. I don't even know if they've exploded. I should probably go in and check them like today or tomorrow. But um, anyway, your root beer is still sitting in the refrigerator. Um, so as we saw though, the, the yeast, when they run out of oxygen, they're actually going to uh, revert into anaerobic respiration, a form of alcohol fermentation, right? So all fermentation is, is glycolysis with the regeneration of NAD+. And it's that regeneration of NAD+, that causes the byproduct of either lactic acid or ethanol to form. We have alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. And um, so I, honestly, the, the only thing I, I would know is just that fermentation is a way for an organism to make ATP without oxygen. It's not very efficient, but at least for yeast, it can keep them alive for a certain amount of time. For your muscle cells, it can keep them functioning for a certain amount of time, um, and that there's byproducts that get made, so ethanol or lactate. I wouldn't get too caught up in exactly how that's done. I would just know that this is a thing. All right, and then um, I, gosh, hold on. My, uh, oops. Anyway, I, I'll read that. I won't spend time trying to change the, the view screen. But um, I want to just give you something interesting. Um, sugar, so just a little um, information about sugar. I was trying to find something really interesting about muscles and lactic acid fermentation, and I just kind of ran out of time, so I just wanted to leave you with the, something that's not actually even relevant to you guys, but might one day. Um, sugar can actually make the aging process worse um, because it's a process called glycation in which excess blood sugar binds to the collagen. Remember, collagen's a protein in your skin that keeps it elastic, um, and, and sugar can bind to collagen, making it less elastic. So what people notice is when they go on really low-carb diets, like the ketogenic diet, which we still don't know if it's actually healthy long-term, but I do know even um, personally, when I go on a really low-carb diet, after about a week, I'll look in the mirror and I'll just be like, oh my God, like my wrinkles get so much. I mean, I don't, 
I don't think I have like severe wrinkles or anything, but you know, at 36, I'm kind of getting to the age where that's becoming a, you know, under eye cream is becoming like a thing I should probably start using. But um, I do notice my skin looks completely different. I've heard that from other people before. So anyway, just something kind of interesting um, to think about. And so the question that should come into your mind is, well, if someone's not eating any sugar, how do they do cellular respiration? Um, and so, well, I'm not gonna go back to the diagram. I'm just gonna tell you, and I've said this in class, um, your, the fats will have to go through a pretty extensive process where they get where they get processed and then they enter into the citric acid cycle. They bypass glycolysis and enter directly into the citric acid cycle, which I think some would argue is an actually more efficient use of energy. So just a little FYI there. All right, here is your practice FRQ. This FRQ, I think um, this FRQ would probably be about a 15 minute one. So if you want to stop right there, or at least just stop and read it over so that you have in your mind what's going on. And then I'm going to go over the answers. So if you want to work on this FRQ, pause now. Okay, uh, what I want to do is go over the answers. So what you have here is oxygen consumption. Oxygen consumption over time. All right, and you have four lines, and then you can see over here different temperatures. All right, so it says that an agricultural biologist was evaluating two newly developed varieties of wheat. So we have two types of wheat. Seedlings are germinated on moist paper towels at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, who cares about that? Oxygen consumption of the two-day-old seedlings was measured at different temperatures. Okay, so you have uh, wheat type A, wheat type B, each one was tested at a different temperature and you're looking at oxygen consumption. So if you know this is tied to cellular respiration, you know as oxygen consumption increases, the rate of cellular respiration is also increasing. So A wants you to calculate the rate of oxygen consumption milliliter per minute of each variety of wheat at seven and 17, show your work. So what you would have here is four answers and these would be the answers. All right, so if you want to pause there and check your work, uh, you're, doing rise, you're doing rise over run. You're just calculating slope. So if you know how to do rise over run, calculate slope, you know how to calculate rate. All right, um, on this year's AP exam, you actually don't need a calculator. So cool, we don't even need to worry about you knowing how to do this. Um, but just in case, it's a good brain exercise. All right, B says explain the relationship between metabolism and oxygen consumption and discuss the effects of temperature. Well, it looks like, hmm, but on variety A, you have squares, okay? And variety B, you have circles. It appears to me that as temperature increases, oxygen consumption increases. And so there's this lab that I do every year. Uh, this year, I decided not to do it just because, eh, I don't know, I was feeling a little paranoid. Um, but I do this lab, and lots of AP biology teachers do this lab. I just felt like I just couldn't get away with it this year. Um, we take goldfish, and we very, very gently increase the temperature of the water, and then we very, very gently decrease the temperature of the water. Last year, we did not have any goldfish deaths, um, as I told them their grade depended on it. So the goldfish, like, they can be fine. And these temperatures, they're fine. But um, a lot of students get really upset about it. So we didn't do it. Um, but what we did find in the years past, and hopefully you believe me, as we increase the water temperature of the goldfish, so what we would measure is the movement of the gills. And so they actually breathe faster, so they consume oxygen faster. You know, they get oxygen from, dissolved oxygen from the water. Um, so gill movement would be a direct correlation of how much oxygen they were consuming. And as we cooled them down, um, oxygen consumption decreased. So we can see this happening in, in uh, seedlings too. All right, so what you would find here is you would need to say as metabolism increases, oxygen consumption increases, or as metabolism decreases, oxygen consumption decreases. Um, then you would just, I mean, you just state what you'd see on the graph. And so, um, and you would want to say, uh, compare variety A to B. So it looked like variety A uh, was slower than variety B, okay. And then you would want to just have a little bit of elaboration uh, why does this happen? And what I would tell it, kinetic energy increases with temperature, therefore chemical reactions increase. And enzyme, yeah, chemical reactions increase. So that would be the explanation. And so then the third C, C said, in the second experiment, variety A was treated with a chemical that prevents NADH 
from being oxidated to NAD+. So that means NAD that's picked up a hydrogen and an electron is unable to drop off its hydrogen and electron to the electron transport chain. So what is the effect? And the answer is metabolism or respiration decreases, oxygen consumption decreases, and the reason would be glycolysis or the electron, I'm sorry, the electron transport chain would stop, ATB production would decrease, oxygen can no longer accept electrons from the electron transport chain. All right, uh, what I find frustrating about this question is that they don't, they don't tell you how many things they want you to say or how many points each, um, each question is. And I think with the new exam format, you no longer have to guess as much with all of that. But I still, this is, this is all we have. This is the only question I even had to show you at this point. Um, from the old exam, I do have two new exam questions that you, one you'll do tomorrow on your own, and then the second one we'll do during our Zoom call. All right, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching, and I hope you got something out of that. Talk to you guys later.